And let's go to our Father in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Almighty God, we thank you for the blessings of this day, the opportunity we have to gather together to study your word and to praise you, to remember the death, burial, and resurrection of your Son and our Savior. Father, we offer thanks at this time for Belvie being able to come home, uh, that uh, she is on the mend, and, and we're so very thankful to live in a time uh, where we have uh, medicines and we have the knowledge and understanding uh, to be able to deal with these matters as best as we can. But certainly, Father, we know that all good and perfect things come from you and that you are truly the great physician of the soul. Father, we pray for Tennessee and him being on the men that uh, he will soon be able to be uh, joined back with us, that we can be encouraged by his presence and lift him up as well. Father, we thank you for those uh, who are here at Freetown, the entire Freetown family. Uh, we ask that you would strengthen our love for one another, our love for you, for the truth, and that as we go into the world that we're mindful of our place, that we are in the world but we are not of the world and that we are to do what we can to help expand the borders of the kingdom here on earth until the coming of your son father we pray as we go through this study that you would be with us and that uh, we would lift you up and it's all a true account of your word in christ's holy name we pray amen okay so we're continuing on in this this short course of miracles um Last week, we might finish today, we might not. And, and you know, it really is a short course. It's, it's just primarily meant to be a refresher uh, because I think we are all here pretty much uh, to one degree or another on the same page when it comes to biblical miracles. Say biblical miracles are certainly things that occur that we don't understand. Uh, I'm not going to pretend that that doesn't happen. Um, but just because something happens that we may not understand, that does not necessarily mean that it's a miracle either. Uh, you know, I've always kind of found it interesting how uh, science, and y'all know that I'm not anti-science or anything, but they claim to know the creation of the world, the you know the big bang the origin and it started at this place at this time this many years ago and yet a week later you'll see a news article and say oh we've discovered a new fish you know it's kind of okay you're going to tell me that you know the origin of the world you don't even have this world fully explored yet so just kind of those, those interesting things and and really last week uh we were going over Primarily the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we, we understand Pentecostalism, Assembly of God, and looking at their four square beliefs, uh, and uh, that there's three different types of baptism uh, that they hold to. The first being, ba being baptized into the body of Christ, which is primarily your confession. Then you have water baptism, which is uh, that outward expression for them of an inward faith, meaning that you are showing the world that you have been baptized into Christ, that you've confessed Christ. And then you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit where you're able to perform some type of miracle, whether it's prophecy or speaking in tongues or uh, what have you. It's always interesting that... Um, any time it comes to the miracle of being able to raise the dead, there's never any witnesses uh, except those on the payroll. You might remember me mentioning uh, Andrew Womack. He is, uh, runs uh, Karis in Colorado. I can't remember the town it's outside of, but might be outside of Denver, but uh, runs an entire college uh, teaching people uh, this type of stuff and not too long ago they were having a lecture series or something if you remember me telling you and the woman she was sitting there in the pew and her baby died and she brought the baby up and the baby w had blue lips and all of this and they brought the baby back from the dead and even though there's three to five cameras and everybody on the planet having a cell phone now there's no video evidence of it ever happening 
um, just kind of those interesting things. There is actually a place here in Dallas that is very big on teaching it. And I'm trying to remember the name. I mean, it's it's huge. It's like the Church of the World. It's, I don't know, the Church of the World of Jesus Christ or something like that. But it's here in the Dallas, uh, the DFW Metroplex. But it's big building and, and the letters are like painted or spray painted on the side or, or something. But there's people teaching this. Um, and it's interesting, and we have to be careful, because yes, the biblical miracles being performed today, it is a false doctrine. But, and the reason that I say we have to be careful is because some people were simply raised that way. It isn't something that you know, they came to be believe on their own. It's something that they were taught by their parents and grandparents, and you know, so it goes back, and it's deeply rooted in them. And the easiest way to turn someone away from the gospel is to start offending their family or to start talking bad about their family, you know. Well, you can't believe this because you're absolutely crazy if you believe this. Well, are you calling my mama crazy? Okay, I'm done talking to you. You calling my grandmama crazy? I'm done talking to you. So we do have to be very careful. And the church uh, is not... Um, isolated in uh, things that, that are taught that are, are wrong. And what I mean by that is just how there are schools who teach uh, this, these biblical miracles and what have you, there are preaching schools up north that will teach the AD 70 theory or, or the Max King doctrine, meaning that everything that the book of Revelation says, it's already come to pass, Jesus has already come, it's kind of pointless now. There are actually preaching schools up north that teach that. So uh, there's things uh, in even within the brotherhood. So so we have to be very careful. Um, but we left off looking at the baptism of the Holy Spirit, noticing that there's only two times in all of Scripture where the Holy Spirit falls on uh, a person. And that was in Acts chapter 2, uh, with the falling on the 12 apostles, uh, and how they began to speak there on the day of Pentecost. And then the next one in Acts chapter 10, with Cornelius and his household. And that there's... It, those are those are important events one acts chapter two is fulfillment of prophecy and that this is when the church is going to be established on the day of pentecost his glory is going to come out of zion it fulfills also what christ was telling them that i need to go away the comforter will come and and what have you then we have acts chapter 10 another significant part regarding uh the the Holy Spirit falling on Cornelius in his household. Why? What does that display there in Acts chapter 10? Open to the, open to the Gentiles. And we also note that the only two times in Scripture uh, where the Holy Spirit falls on someone was when it came from God. It didn't come from another man. Um, and so we, we have that. So we looked at, at that um, and that the only one who had the power to pass on gifts outside of Christ, I'll say, uh, were the apostles. You know, in Acts, we noticed how prior to the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, they did have a measure of the Holy Spirit, a measure of apostolic power, because he sent them out to heal the sick, raise the dead, and what have you. But then the fullness of that power did not come until Pentecost. And then they also had the ability to lay hands on someone and give them a, a measure of the Holy Spirit to be able to do these things. We talked how Simon, uh, when he was with Philip, and there's Samaria, and many people were converted, and they send Peter and John there to lay hands on them. Simon, who had converted, he sees that the power of the Holy Spirit comes from the laying on of hands. It very clearly says that. And then he tried to what? He tried to buy it. He tried to buy God. You know? And so we left off 
uh, there and we're picking up, you know, what was the purpose then of miraculous gifts? Well, it, and, and it should be obvious to, to all that the main purpose of the gifts was not to heal the world, to give sight to the blind, the lame to walk. That was not the primary purpose of miraculous gifts. Because if you think about it, all Christ had to do would be to speak one word and every disease on the planet for everybody is gone. Every person on the planet who is lame can now walk. Every person of any type of illness is fully cleansed. So if the purpose of miracles was to simply, you know, give sight to the blind, the lame to walk, then the miracles are an absolute failure. And we know that Christ didn't fail. Um, because of that, the purpose in Christ performing these miracles was to establish his credentials and his I identity as, as the Messiah, the Son of God, not to heal the world. Uh, Matthew chapter 9, Matthew chapter 9, verses 2 through 8, uh, it's a very familiar account, or should be. Uh, there it reads, they brought him a paralytic laying, lying on a bed. And seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralytic, Take courage, son, your sins are forgiven. And some of the scribes said to themselves, This fellow blasphemes. Now this is uh, Matthew 9, 2 through 8. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why are you thinking evil in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of God has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, Get up, pick up your bed, and go home. And he got up and went home. But when the crowd saw this, they were awestruck and glorified God who had given such authority to men. So Jesus there, he, he sees this lame man and he says, your sins are forgiven. He didn't heal him right away. His purpose was not to come and, and physically heal people. It, it, the purpose was to seek and save the lost. It was to preach the kingdom of God. After he was baptized, you know, the first thing he preaches is repent for the kingdom of God is, is at hand. And so he, he preaches that. But then when they say that he's blaspheming, he says, okay, let me show you what authority I have. And he heals this man. Now, if we were to look over to John chapter 5, and we won't just because of time, John chapter 5, it starts talking around verse 30 or so about these different witnesses. Uh, Jesus speaking, and he says, you know, John was a witness, right? He said, God's a witness, Moses, the scriptures. But there in verse 36, he says, and the works that I do, they bear witness, there in John 5, 36, they bear witness uh, about me. So the, the purpose there is to have that, you know, they, there had been others through the years who claimed that they were the Messiah, right? Uh, Gamaliel also testified before the council that they were, uh, as they were about to inflict punishment on some of the apostles there in Acts chapter 5, and so now we have Jesus claiming that he is the true one. And we know that Jesus has these I am statements throughout the gospel accounts. Um, when Christ told the man that his sins were forgiven, there wasn't any black cloud over his head that, you know, or anything like that, or any visible sign. It was simply words that Christ spoke. Now for that man, those words meant something. It meant that his sins were forgiven. There was no outside sign to prove to anybody else that this was the Messiah. He simply said, your sins are forgiven. Could have been anybody. He was, uh, again, Christ was not the only person to claim to be the Messiah. There were plenty of those throughout the years. We've had plenty of those in the last 200 years claiming to be the Messiah. It's, it's nothing new or the voice of God. It's nothing new at all. That's especially prevalent in the, um, in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons. You know, the, the main speaker is called the prophet. You know, or you need to go ask the prophet or, or what have you. So, but to show that he is the Son of God, what happens? 
He tells the man to get up and walk. There is a miraculous healing. That, mir that miracle was not to forgive the man's sins. The miracle was to establish who Christ was in the face of those who were opposing him. It, it wasn't to, to cure the paralytic. It was to clarify his identity. Any thoughts or comments so far? Okie dokie. Another occasion when uh, John the Immerser was in prison, he sent his disciples uh, to confirm that Christ was the Messiah. Uh, you remember when Jesus uh, was coming and John, he says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John is now in prison and he hears about you know all of these miraculous uh, works going on and so he sends some of his followers to find out you know okay who's doing this are, are you are you the one that that we've been waiting for are you the one that i've been preparing the way for there in matthew chapter 11 verses 2 through 5 Matthew 11, 2 through 5, it reads, When John, while in prison, heard of the works of Christ, he didn't hear the words of Christ, he heard of the works of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the expected one, or shall we look for someone else? Jesus answered and said to them, Go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. So again, we see the purpose of the miracles was to establish the identity of Christ. And John, being in prison, he didn't hear the words that Christ was saying. He didn't hear the sermons or the message, this is messages that he was delivering or the parables, or, but he heard of the works, right? Just to get, you know, works, actions travel a lot faster than words do, and they're remembered more. You know, let's say, for example, this Sunday morning, I'm up there preaching a sermon and I step down at the end, you know, when we're giving the invitation and I trip uh, off the top stairs, you know, I tumble like a ball of yarn down to the floor and I get up and I'm kind of, you know, I'm, I'm out of my senses because I just took a good fall, right? How many of you are going to really remember three weeks from now what I preached that morning? Not at all. But are you going to remember me tripping down the stairs? Oh, probably for several years. Many, many years. Maybe until you're, you're gone from this earth, you might, you know, remember it. Be like, you know, I remember Mike. I don't know, it was about... 30, 40 years ago or so. I don't remember what he was saying, but man, I remember he just fell down those stairs like a slinky, you know? And so the word, you know, so works, actions travel a lot faster, and that's, that's what he heard. So what about the miracles then that the, that the apostles performed? You know, they really had the same purpose. You know, we go back to Mark chapter 16 and the commission where Jesus promised that they would perform different miracles. And then in Mark 16 in verse 20, it says there, And they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the word by the signs that followed. There, there in Mark chapter 16 and verse 20. Now, here's part of the reason for that. When you look at the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 16, it, it ha it's there talking about prophets. And this is a great one, by the way, to use if you're talking to the Mormon guys riding around on their bicycles. Deuteronomy chapter, six, chapter 16, it's talking about prophets. And it says there that if someone speaks and these things come to pass, then you know that person is from God. But if someone is speaking for God, telling you things that are going to happen, and they don't come to pass, then you know they're a false prophet, and that person's to be stoned until they die. Okay? Just to be clear, since this is being recorded, Deuteronomy 16 is a great verse to use with the guys running around on bicycles, knocking on your door, asking to study the Book of Mormon. Do not stone them. 
okay? Because I heard the chuckles. Don't, don't go running into the garden looking for the smoothest stone that you can, picking up a sling like your David and just chasing them down the street. Please don't do that. That, that, is, that is not love, okay? Um, but I point that out because if the apostles were going out and just preaching the word and saying that these things are happening, but those things don't actually happen, then what are they? They're false prophets. And what happens to a false prophet? They get stoned until they die. So, it, it, so it's a matter of their preaching about Christ, and in order to confirm who Christ is, they perform these miracles in the name of Christ. Does that make sense? Because we would have, for example, Christ casting out demons, and what did the people say? He casts out demons by the power of demons. And it's like, no, I'm doing these things. I'm healing this person in the name of Jesus Christ. I want to be clear as to who this power comes from. So that later, maybe not right then, sure, there's going to be some people. We know Christ had plenty of followers. But there's going to be people then who recognize, okay, they're saying that they're doing it in the name of Jesus Christ. And I'm seeing Jesus Christ do the same thing. Uh, this is a guy unlike any other. Uh, you remember when they sent him to be arrested? The Pharisees sent their soldiers to arrest Christ, but they came back empty handed because they said, no one talks like this guy talks. No one acts the way that this guy acts. You people claim to be religious. This guy is religion, you know. So that, that type of thing. So, uh, you know, so it drew followers, but it also confirmed not only for the immediate moment, but also for later when people back in 2022 would be studying this small thing called miracles and looking at it, then we could say they were doing these things through the power of Christ, not the power of anybody else. So it wasn't just an immediate um, confirmation of the identity of Christ but it's one that will stand as long as the earth stands because we know that the grass withers the flower fades but the word of God what the word of God stands forever so until the end of time as we know it we're gonna have that evidence why because they preached in his name and they healed in his name thus confirming his identity any thoughts or comments Okay. So the miracles then were to confirm the word. Peter and the other, they were preaching to the multitude uh, on Pentecost in at least 16 different languages. You know, um, and we know that because of the places that are listed out there, uh, Pamphylia, Phrygia, uh, those outside of you know Greece and you know it lists out all of these different provinces and you might be thinking to yourself well how is it that you've got 12 apostles but they're talking 16 different languages right I mean really it's not hard to say you know let, let's say that I, I'm bilingual I'm not by any stretch of the imagination I can say my name <laughs> you know I can ask how you're doing that's about it but let's, so uh, I'm one person, but I'm talking in English. And then let's say uh, over here, you know, we used to have the Hispanic congregation uh, meeting over there. So let's say it was all English over here and Spanish over here. And so, you know, maybe speak English and then turn over here, speak Spanish. It's, I'm not speaking them both at the same time, but I'm still one individual. So we can't have those 12 apostles speaking, you know, 16 different languages and it not sound like the gibberish we get today. Um, and Peter, he reminded the people there in Acts chapter 2 with a prophecy in Joel 2 uh, that cited that the day's events would be a fulfillment of the prophecy. Uh, that miracles, signs, and wonders would be poured out uh, at that time. And he even says, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. You know, uh, it was a sign, a uh, miracle that he was, or, or miracle even, that, that he was speaking the truth. We can use miracle because of them speaking in these various languages. Um, when Paul or, or others of the apostles went into some city and began to, to proclaim that the Messiah had come, uh, many were probably thinking, yeah, we, we've heard it before, so what was different? 
What was different about that is that what they were saying was confirmed by the signs that followed. It wasn't just a matter of going in and I'm preaching about Christ. We know, we, we know for example, from uh, Acts chapter 17 that, and other places that Paul, when he went into a new place, the first thing that he did was he went to the synagogue and he would reason with the Jews. And the whole reason that he went to, uh, to the synagogue first is because at that time, in that course of events, it had not been open to the Gentiles or Paul was not aware that it had been open to the Gentiles. Remember, Paul first saw his mission as going to the Jewish people. So every time he went into a new town, he would go to the synagogue. Now, it's not like today where you've got a church building on every corner. It typically had maybe one central synagogue or, or place of, of worship. So he would go there, reason with them for a couple of weeks. But eventually, they got so thick-headed about it that he basically said, I'm done. Almost like Pilate washing his hands uh, of the guilt uh, of dealing with Christ at, at his trial, quotes. Um, but, uh, you know, Paul kind of washes his hands and says, I'm going to the Gentiles, you know. Uh, but it's, all of these things are confirmed by the works that, that followed. Thoughts? Okay. Is everything kind of clear so far? Okay, I mean, if I need to clear something up, you know, just mention. So question then, has the word been confirmed? Do we think the word of God has been confirmed? Not a trick question, I promise you. I'm not trying to trap you, absolutely. And yes, an emphatic yes. Over and over again, the word has been confirmed. We don't need to confirm it again. Just a, just a thought here. Abraham Lincoln. Anybody remember who shot him? Who assassinated Abraham Lincoln? Okay. Booth, John Wilkes Booth. Okay. That's been confirmed, right? There was a trial. Kind of. Evidence presented and what have you. It's known. It is confirmed that John Wilkes Booth assassinated Abraham Lincoln. Do we need to have another trial and confirm it again? Are you sure? Why not? Because it's already been confirmed. History's already confirmed it. People who were there confirmed it. Witnesses, uh, you know, co-conspirators, all of that was already confirmed. And that's just an example in saying that we don't need to go back and reconfirm the Bible. We don't need to reconfirm the word of God. There were people who were there who confirm it. And they were confirmed, you know, they preached the word of God. They performed these miracles in the name of Christ, which confirmed the identity of Christ. And it confirmed that what they were saying was true. We don't need to go back, back and, and try to rehash that. And the fact is, we couldn't anyways. How am I supposed to go back? How is any of us? I don't care, care if you're the most learned, uh, you know, forensic pathologist on the planet. How are you going to go back almost 2,000 years and confirm, yes, even if you had a skeleton, yes, that skeleton at one point was raised from the dead. How would you confirm that? Or, yes, that person was blind, but now they, well, they don't see now because they're dead, but they, they saw and now they're dead again. Uh, you, there's no possible way for us to go back and confirm that any more than there's way for us to go back and, and reconfirm John Wilkes Booth, you know, killing Abraham Lincoln. It, it's, it's already been con confirmed. It's been proven. We don't have to, to go through it again. And so what we can do is we can present, even with John Wilkes Booth, the evidence that was already established in order to reprove the same point. So if someone for uh, the example, you know, John Wilkes Booth and Abraham Lincoln, if someone were to say, well, I don't necessarily believe that John Wilkes Booth assassinated Abraham Lincoln in Ford's theater. So what are we going to do if we want to prove that? We're going to go to the evidence that has already been confirmed. 
We're not going to go back and try to come up with new evidence and dig into all of that. We're going to say, look, this is what they have. This is what they presented. Everything points to this, right? So when it comes to us today, in order to confirm the word of God, to confirm the identity of Christ, we don't have to go back and try to recreate the crucifixion every Easter, okay? What we need to do is just look to the word of God and point out this is what it is this is what has been established this is what has been confirmed and this is why does that make sense that's why everything comes down to going back to the word of god that's why we have to to know our bibles doesn't mean you're not going to be caught off guard i am caught off guard all the time you know i was a little bit caught off guard when when, uh, when someone asked me the question and the father's day bulletin article is who was cain's wife so, but I didn't want to save that for another week. So that kind of caught me off guard. We got caught. We get caught off guard all the all the time by by things. So we don't. So we just go to what's already been established. And his identity, and the scriptures, and the fulfillment of scriptures were established through the performing of miracles. So really, they're they're intertwined, and that's how we how we address both of them. Um. We don't need miracles today to reconfirm the word. It's already been confirmed. The faith that was passed down once and for all to the saints, Jude writes. Uh, Peter would write that there's no prophecy of any t private interpretation, but holy men of God were moved by the Spirit. The f it's delivered once and for all to the saints. No prophecy of private interpretation. You know, it's, it's kind of interesting. Uh, there, is a, there is a quote by the uh, Puritan and denominationalist John Owen that, that I've always really liked when it comes to people talking about, you know, prophecy. God told me or God spoke to me or God laid it on my heart or, or whatever. Uh, and he said, <clears throat> uh, basic summary of it is that if prophecy agrees with scripture then it's pointless if it disagrees with scripture it's unscriptural so people trying to go around and say you know god spoke to me and god told me this well if it are if it's already in scripture then why would god tell it to you again and it doesn't make any sense god already repeats himself and he repeats himself in scripture and if it's against scripture why should i bother listening to you you're against scripture really just kind of sums it up in a nutshell there right so then how long this is the other question though how long would the miracles or the miraculous age last you know because there are some people who would say well when the last apostle died that would be john so we're looking at late first century we wrote the revelation of jesus christ somewhere around ad 90 or so so you know it would have been done there but we have to remember that the ability to perform miracles first it was not given to everybody but also that remember the apostles laying their hands on people right and those people would then go out and they would preach and they would teach and they would baptize perform miracles confirming the word but remember also they could not pass that on to anyone else it only came through the laying on of the hands of the apostles so it's not actually accurate to say that the age of miracles died with the last apostle if let's say I'm 20 years old and I'm a follower of John, uh, the Apostle John, not John the Immerser, and you know he's back from Patmos. He didn't die on Patmos, but he's back from Patmos. I'm a follower of him, and he lays hands on me. I'm 20 years old to be able to perform miracles, and I live till I'm 50. Well, that's taken me into the second century, right? Now I can't pass on that ability to perform miracles, but I am still able to do them so as far as how long the age of miracles lasted we don't exactly know but what we do know is that it would have ended when the last person who had their hands who an apostle laid their hands on when they died uh, it would have been done you know and, and we know just from the 
the average age of the people at, uh, at the time with health and medicine and what have you, most people were not living even into their 70s. You know, many people were dying in their mid to late 50s and, and 60s uh, just because of disease and, and what have you. Um, and there's evidence to support that. For example, 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13, we know that is the chapter of what? The chapter of love. The love is patient, love is kind, right? It's the love chapter. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 8, and 8 through 10 reads, Love never fails, but if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If, they are if there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. So Paul says that the gift of prophecy is going to be done away with. Tongues, the miraculous knowledge, the uh, ability to be able to speak in other languages, that's going to cease and be done away. When? When the perfect comes. Now, some claim, uh, some claim that... Uh, that refers to the coming of Christ. Those who still want to promote the ability to perform miracles to, in today's age, today's time, they want to say, well, the perfect is not the word of God. The perfect is Christ himself. So it's not going to cease until Christ comes. Right? Um, and so they'll keep going until that turns but notice there in 1 Corinthians 13 verses 8 and 10 8 through 10 that the text says the perfect it doesn't say the perfect one which would indicate a perfect uh, a person it says the perfect right and it doesn't say he that is perfect either see there's so many different ways that it could have been worded to distinguish that it was indeed talking about Christ. It could have said when the perfect one comes, when Jesus Christ comes, when the Lamb of God comes, when the Savior of the world comes, when the perfect one comes. There are so many different ways that it could have been worded, but instead it says the perfect. Right? Yeah. Um, and, and to that, let me ask a question. Is Christ a that? Is Christ a that? T-H-A-T. That's like calling the Holy Spirit an it, right? Christ is not a that. Christ is, is a person. He is a, a second person of the Godhead, the Trinity there. So the point, he's not, a, that would be an inanimate object, right? The point that Paul's making is, is clear, that during the first, first century, the revelation was not complete. Um, it, it took another 50 years or so for the New Testament to be completed, okay? Uh, when, when Paul is writing this, the Bible's not being done written, basic, basically, basically. Um, and there's evidence, uh, again, that John wrote uh, Revelation in the 90s, not 1990s, uh, even though that was probably a better year. Um, and so that's why the proclaimers of the gospel, they had to be inspired by the Holy Spirit in order to know what to teach and what to preach. Right? You see, we have the apostles, and just kind of kind of summarizing a, a little bit where we are well let me say this John chapter 16 and then I'll, I'll go back and summarize um, Christ told the apostles that after he had gone the whole the whole of God's truth would be made available to them John chapter 16 verses 12 through 14 I have many more things to say to you but you cannot bear them now but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of his own initiative. But whatever he hears, he will speak, 
and he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, and he will take of mine and will disclose it, for he will take of mine and disclose it to you. So just kind of a summary of where we are is we have the apostles. They're walking with Christ. Christ is still alive. They're, uh, I mean, Christ is living, but you know what I mean. The word became flesh and he's dwelling among them, right? And he gives them a, a short measure, we'll say a half measure, whatever word you want to use, to be able to perform miracles. And they go off and they're performing, they're proclaiming the word of God and they are performing these miracles to confirm the word of God. There's the death, burial, and resurrection. They're in Jerusalem. Acts chapter 2, Pentecost happens. The Holy Spirit falls on them. And the first thing that they start doing is proclaiming the word of God in these various languages or tongues. Thank you, King James. But these various languages. And Peter tells them that it is to fulfill what was said by Joel. Well, they're going around and they're talking to the Jews until Acts chapter 10, God says, okay, now it's time for it to be open to the Gentiles. So the Holy Spirit falls on Cornelius and his household. That tells Peter it's open to the Gentiles. Paul's now going off to the Gentiles. Others are going to the Jews. It's, it's going everywhere now. We get to si or Philip rather in Samaria. He's preaching. People are baptized. He he's not an apostle. So he can't lay hands on them. So they send for Peter and John. Simon sees this and recognizes that it's because they were laying their hands on people, tries to buy it. Well, later on, Paul, he, when he's writing and he gets there in 1 Corinthians, he says, look, we have all these things now. We're doing them in part. It's only partial because basically, and he could have put this in parentheses, because the entirety of God's word has not yet been written. But when it is, and we get to Jude, and Jude says the faith that was delivered once and for all to the saints, once and for all, in, finito, this is it, right? So Paul says, we've got it right now, but when it's all written, it's over. There's no more need for it. Everything's been confirmed. And we know that our part, we don't need to go back and try to reconfirm it by coming up with new evidence or looking at new things because it's already been confirmed. So what do we do? We look at the evidence and we look at the testimony of the people who were there, just as we would uh, if we were to look at the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, JFK, anybody else in history, you know? Makes sense, kind of where we are? I need to clear anything up, smooth anything out because we're gonna be done. I went a minute and a half over. Gary said he wasn't going to be here for class. I thought, he, I thought he wouldn't be here to ring the bell, so I thought I had more time, but nope, popped in just to ring the bell. Uh, okay, well, if there's no questions, we'll go ahead and continue on uh, next week. I really appreciate it. And if you do have questions and you didn't want to ask them in class, then please, you know, just, just let me know. Thank you all very much.